also record. So I think we're just about to be live on Facebook. Let's double check a few things before we get started. Hopefully the kids are seeing this message and joining us to see their questions answered. Um, yeah, we're live. Okay, we are live. Thank you so much. All right, well, welcome everyone to our second installment of Campside Chats with a Scientist. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm with Green Kid Crafts. I'll be um, hosting and asking some questions today. Um, one minute about this program before we get started. So as many of you know, we are um, award-winning science and craft box um, you know, producers, uh, we have a growing community of kids around the world who do these crafts. They're all science and environmental focus. And, um, and this month, as part of our summer program, we had boxes going out on botany and on rainforest. Um, we invited kids to submit their questions. The idea being that sometimes, um, sometimes kids ask a lot of questions that are hard to answer <laughs> as parents. I know my children do. And, um, and we have really enjoyed getting these questions in and in turn, looking around in our community to see who would know the answers. And um, that's how we found Whitney. So Whitney is here live today from a real rainforest. Um, my rainforest is a little bit, a little bit doctored, fake, <laughs> but uh, but I wanted to be in a rainforest too. So, um, so Whitney is a botanist. She lives in Southeast Alaska. I'll let her introduce herself in just one minute. But I will just say um, we're so glad to have you here today, and thank you for joining us. And live streaming from your real rainforest is is really special. So. Um, thank you for that. And maybe before we go into the questions, I could ask you to give us a little introduction about yourself, how you came to live in a rainforest and, and what, you know, inspired you to study, um, study botany and science. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Whitney Rapp. I do live in a Southeast Alaska rainforest uh, near the capital in Juneau. Uh, I in the background is my backyard and those are the trees and everything in a rainforest here in Alaska. It's not like it's a tropical rainforest because it's quite cold. Uh, it's probably in the 50s right now so not probably your typical summer weather. Um, I've always wanted to be a scientist um, and so I have a lot of different backgrounds um, because it's great to know a lot about a lot of things um, so that you can be diverse and be able to apply many different skills uh, and lifelong learning. Just gotta keep learning. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 I mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and I have, you know, I have a degree in biology. I have a master's degree in landscape design and ecology. And I've been working in a bunch of different fields um, and came to Alaska, oh, 17 years ago. So older than probably most of you. <laughs> wow. And, um, one of the things that you shared with me when we were um, preparing for this was that where you live right now is actually only accessible. Well, it's, it's basically inaccessible. So can you, can you talk about what that's like <laughs> quickly? It's so interesting. Sure. Okay. So you can't drive where I live. Um, the only way you can get here is by plane or by boat. Technically, I am to the rest of the country, but there are mountains and glaciers that block my path to drive to any place. So all we have is a most 15 miles of road um, here in my town. And otherwise, my car has to go on a ferry or a landing craft, um, or I have to fly out. Wow, that's amazing. And I can't believe there's a good connection for Zoom and Facebook Live right now. Um, the wonders of the world, I guess. Um, that's, that's super, that's super interesting. Um, okay, well, thank you for that. We might have a few questions from the audience a little bit later, but I think for now, what I'm going to do is get started with some of the kids' questions. So let me pull those up. And, um, and let me also just, if 
folks are joining live, you know, say hi um, in, the, in the comments, in the chat. Let us know you're here. Um, thank you for joining us today. Okay, so first question that we got from our kids. Um, all right, so this is a question from Jordan Cole. What does a botanist do? Um, and how do you become one? So that's a great question. Whitney, I'm sure you know the answer to that. <laughs> sure. A botanist who studies plants. So it's not a plantologist, it's a botanist. So don't don't try to look for the right, the right word there. Um, and you know, botany studies plants and it's all different things. You could be studying rare plants. So those are the ones that are very uncommon and hard to find, or you could be doing invasive plants. So those are the plants that aren't supposed to be in that landscape. Uh, there are people that study how plants change over time and that's called the process of succession. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different skills and things. So it could be field work, it could be lab work, it could be studying evolution, which is how plants change or how they diverge, or you could be looking at the DNA, which is how, you know, the code that makes the plants. Um, and basically you just continue to go to school and study what you're interested in and do some research and otherwise. So it's just kind of a lifelong process. Absolutely. The, thank you. That's, um, that's interesting. I think um, a botanist sounds like such a broad term, right? And I think uh, a lot of us forget how many specialties there can be within, uh, within a field. And um, is, there, is there a particular, um, you know, angle or specialty that, that you're doing right now with your, with your work in the rainforest? Mm -hmm. So definitely my interest is invasive plants. Um, there are very few invasive plants in Alaska at this point, but um, so it's, it's still a manageable task, but it's also a task that needs attention on a routine basis, um, particularly if climate change, if we get warmer um, and drier and all that, it's a very accommodating place for plants to grow that aren't supposed to grow here, so. That's so, yeah, that's so interesting and so pertinent to, you know, um, environmental topics that are important to many in our community. And um, it's true that we often think about climate change and rising oceans, right? But there's so many other um, effects. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure that must be fascinating um, to study. So thank you about that. Um, all right, I hope that answers your question, Jordan. Um, next question we have here is from Olivia O'Brien. And it's a simple one. What are rainforests? Why are they called rainforests? Sure. If you look at the words rain and forest, let's guess. There is a lot of rain and there are also forests. So as you can see behind me, I've got a hundred foot plus trees growing behind me. Um, it's not the densest of areas, but I have, you know, dense canopy of a lot of trees and then rain. How much rain do you want? Um, I get enough rain to be the height of an adult every year. So it's not currently raining here, but on average, I get um, a, about a, a quarter of an inch of rain a day. So um, one way to think about that is you have a quarter, you know how thick a quarter is? You stack three quarters on top of each other. That's how much rain I get every single day on average. And so if you keep stacking that up, that becomes over a year, 365 days, that's the height of a human. Wow. Um, <laughs> that's a lot so of rain. I get a lot of rain. <laughs> I get a lot of rain. Um, I get a lot of overcast days. Um, it means a very green, lush uh, place. Um, it means I don't have to water garden very often, uh, but it also means that things like mold and moss and fungus grow really well too. Yeah, I can imagine. So um, that's interesting because, you know, I think like my five-year-old too, when I use the word rainforest, she's like, well, we have a forest not far and it rains. Is that a rainforest? <laughs> You're like, well, it's not just a forest when there's rain, but that's, I can understand how that question comes to be. So. So there's something special about these high volumes of, of rain for, 
you know, for all the plant growth. And I think you use the word canopy, which is um, one that's important um, that you see a lot because I guess there's just so many rich species. So behind me, I have um, a, a fake tropical rainforest, right? And that's kind of the image we have, but I can even see in your screen behind you, like these different layers of bushes and plants. And I, it's really interesting to see that in an evergreen, you know, environment. So <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so yep. let's see. Um, I guess the next question we have here is Shelby, um, is there a wood that doesn't rot in water? Is there? Sure, yeah, so <laughs> different trees, different tree staff can produce different oils or, um, and dressing. Um, you know that oil kind of floats to the top and doesn't really mix in well with the water. So if you have a, a tree that produces oils, it becomes more water resistant and, and weatherproof. Um, and there's other chemicals that help um, deter bugs or fungus. And so some trees like in the US, the cedars. So if you've ever heard of like cedar furniture, cedar swing sets, they're using cedar because it's supposed to be outside. It does really well outside, it doesn't rot. Um, if you've ever gone sailing or from tropical places, the wood teak is another um, really rot resistant wood. There's other trees that just do not hold up well and they rot. And that's a really important process in a forest is the rotting because that's all the nutrients going back to the next generation. So interesting. Um, shot resistant wood, you need to paint it or stain it or put some type of preservative on it, um, or it's going to start rotting and you just have to replace it. Right. That's so interesting. So are, um, are these, the cedar and the teak, are these, are these only in rainforest then? Is that something that, that they've developed as a, I don't know, coping mechanism or something like that to the high amount of rain? Uh, I don't think it's exclusively, but there are definitely, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, there are definitely more seemingly. Um, there are definitely some cedars on like the East Coast of the United States that will be more rot resistant or junipers um, are also more rot resistant. So you're offering them as uh, fence posts or something. Yeah. Um, any farmer quickly figures out that they don't repl like replacing their fence very often. So they find the most rot resistant. Um, <laughs> Often the trees that grow slower um, or old growth, they'll be more rot resistant than things that have grown really quickly um, because they just haven't grown as densely. Yeah, how interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, good point about the fence. I think you're, you're totally right about that. <laughs> Nobody likes replacing a fence every few years. So, um, so you mentioned one term, I'm just gonna do a quick follow-up, but you mentioned old growth and some of the people watching might not kind of understand old growth versus new growth. Could you could you real quickly speak to that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Old growth basically means that humans really haven't had much of a in growing for a long time. It is old, but also it has probably grown and trees have fallen, new trees have come in, and so it's really mixed age. So Think about going to school. If you're all in first grade, you're all the same age. You're all about the same height. You've all had a similar experiences, but then say everyone through K through 12 all goes into the gymnasium together. That would be more of a mixed age um, group. So an old growth forest will be much more mixed age, but okay. we're talking like 50, 100, 150, 200, 250 years. So we're mixing everyone up. So we just take everyone mix them all together and so we have some short people some tall people some old people some young people you know everything is all there and what that means is that the little trees growing down at the bottom of the old growth forest it takes them a really long time to grow because they don't have a lot of light because all those big trees have been shading them out so you know you need light to grow um and so old growth trees take a long time to get to be mature trees and that whole process means that they grow more densely they grow more slowly 
if you've ever seen a tree and you've seen all those rings will be really tight in an old growth um, tree versus new growth means that probably humans had some influence on that forest. So they might have cut down trees or maybe there was a, a wildfire that came through caused by humans or something. And so that all that sunlight um, down low means those trees can go really fast at a rate that they wouldn't normally grow. And so that would be a new growth tree because it grew really quickly without all that competition for light. And so those rings are gonna be really wide. It's growing quickly. Um, and it's just not the same tree. Um, so, so many layers to this, right? Um, thank you for that explanation, Whitney. Um, I hope that answered your question. So um, let's see, Everett Bromer. So Casey, I have a, one more question and I'll just take a moment to say hi to folks who are joining us on the live. It looks like Chris and Rachel are here and I think Casey's here. So your question is up next. Um, so thanks so much for taking the time out of your day. Um, so Everett's question um, was what kind of trees are in a rainforest? So unlike a tropical rainforest, I'm in a temperate rainforest. So a temperate rainforest means it's cool and wet pretty much all year round. I am also in Alaska, so it gets cold in the winter, but not. I'm not in a super cold place in Alaska. So in the summers, I'm in the 50s and 60s. In the winter, I'm usually in the 20s and 30s. So I end up getting, in the winter, I can get up to six feet of snow. I might not get very much if it's more. Um, so my trees need to be adapted to um, that range in temperature. Um, and to handle all that snow because it's a wet, heavy snow. It's not a dry snow. Uh, so my trees are mostly Sitka spruce and western hemp. And they're strong enough to be able to stand up to the snow um, and they benefit from all the rain the rest of the year to grow quickly and big. Um, and then I do have some deciduous trees that drop off in the fall and come back out in the spring. Uh, those include things like alder and cottonwood. Uh, but unlike a tropical rainforest, tropical rainforests are super diverse. That means they have lots and lots and lots of species. Created by a glacier 250 years ago. So just as our country forming in the United States, it was dropping off all sand and gravel. So I actually have a very young landscape. Um, and so I don't have all the trees that everywhere else in Alaska would have yet because they just haven't moved here yet. It needs a bird or something else to have them here. Uh, so I, I don't have a lot of trees, but I have really big ones. <laughs> yes, you do. I can see them right there. Thank you for that. Um, there's a little bit of, of connection. So just in case you, you, you missed snippets of this uh, connection issues. I mean, um, there's everything. It sounds like Sitka spruce, western hemlock. I caught alder and cottonwood, some deciduous forest. And I, I think the interesting point was how, how different this Alaskan rainforests from the tropical rainforest behind us because it's new. So it was formed, um, you know, it sounds like 250 years ago with glacier retreat, I think I caught, I hope I don't get this wrong. Uh, but so because of that, it's just a very different ecosystem okay. from, mm -hmm. okay, thank you so much, Whitney. All right, we've got, let's see, we've got two more questions here. Um, Isabella Knoll. Um, asks, um, how much rain do we get in the rainforest and how much do you get in your rainforest? So I know you mentioned this a little bit um, already. So yeah, I think that's the same question. I'm sorry, I just realizing that now. <laughs> okay. Um, so Whitney had, had told us it was three quarters stacked per day and over the year as tall as a person. Um, so that's a lot of rain. And I suppose you, um, uh, have an umbrella or a great raincoat you wear every day or something to be prepared for that. Um, some good boots. All right, the next question we have here is from Katie Danello. Um, what animals live in your rainforest? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, 
I'm in the Alaska rainforest again, so I don't really have monkeys or jaguars or other tropical animals. Um, and I don't really have tree animals that use trees to swing between trees and all that. Um, but I do have bears. I have both brown bears and black bears. I've got porcupines and beavers and I do have, oh, what else? I've got um, wolverines and wow. other sorts of mammals that are um, crawling through the landscape or sometimes climbing some trees, but they don't really swing through the trees here. Because I have all that rain, I have lots and lots of rivers and all those rivers have salmon in them. So that's a really important food source. Um, and it also brings a lot of nutrients up into the landscape uh, that are used by the trees. And then from the air, I don't have toucans or parrots, but I've got eagles and ravens and hawks. Uh, we've got songbirds. So all those birds that are hang out down in the tropical rainforests in the winter, sometimes some of them come all the way back up here for, the, for their, their summer. They're in the winter there, they're in the summer here, um, raising their babies. So it's a different group of animals, but it's definitely a very productive place. I think there's a lot of interesting noises where you live uh, <laughs> at night that you wonder what they are. So I think, you know, it, it sounds like Alaska has its own types of animals, but um, I know, yeah, I know that every, with this rich ecosystem that you have with the plants, there tends to be just a super rich animal ecosystem enjoying, you know, um, or living, living in that. So um, okay, super interesting. Thank you. Um, I have one more question here um, from Charlotte. I think this will be the last one. What kind of meat eating plants, carnivorous plants, do you see? Sure. I actually do have two carnivorous plants around here. I have sundew and butterwort. Um, they're both small plants and they pretty much grow in the same places. So we've got foggy areas and foggy areas are wet areas. Um, there's a lot of moss and stuff, but they're usually fairly acidic and don't have a lot of nutrients. So they're, they're not really great places for plants to grow because they don't have everything that they need. So both of those plants um, are carnivorous because they get their extra nutrients by capturing insects because they have sticky parts to their leaves or they have special sticky parts. Um, and so when they catch an insect, they can then get their nitrogen and phosphorus they're in a funny place. Interesting. Well, thank you. Um, that's, you know, carnivorous plants. I think my my son would be a little disappointed that they don't have teeth and bite like this, but I think we forget that, <laughs> that, that there's a lot of species uh, that are technically carnivorous just by like sticking, you know, cat trapping insects and, and slowly, you know, using that as food. So um, interesting. Thank you so much, Whitney. And um, thank you for, for being here, everyone. I think we're going to wrap this up. Um, I hope you found this useful, insightful. We have so many questions this month that we couldn't possibly answer them all live, um, but we will be sharing quite a few in a blog post afterwards. Um, so if your question didn't get addressed today, it's still on our radar and we'll make sure to get you a question, uh, an answer, I'm sorry. And the last thing I wanna do quickly before we, um, we end is a little raffle drawing. So I think you'll remember that as part of our camp, we have, um, we have a giveaway every month. And this month is um, a, a very cool company called Green Koala. They make you know, natural hand soaps and insect repellent and you know, all kinds of natural products. They're based up in the Northeast of the US and Massachusetts. Um, and they've offered to give away a beautiful gift basket. So I'm going to just try to share my screen here and pick a winner. So what we did here is, um, Let's see, someone on my team set up a beautiful little spinner. So I'm gonna spin this wheel and we're gonna see which of the um, which of the questions stick, who's the winner. So let me just click this and we'll see. There we go. The winner of the gift basket is uh, Steve. 
So Steve Stolberg, we're going to reach out to you, find your address so we know where to send this gift to. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, Whitney, especially from the rainforest, it's, it's wonderful to be able to um, connect kids with real scientists doing amazing, cool stuff all around the world. So we're happy to, to, um, to be able to do that for our members. And for those of you who are um, just joining or not familiar, you can always you know, go to our website, grab one of our kids. Um, they're really wonderful STEAM activity, always with an environmental focus. Um, that's something that's really important to Penny, uh, our founder. And it's something that really brings this community together, I think, in a, in a lovely way. So um, Whitney, um, have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope it doesn't rain too much, <laughs> but yes, it might, who knows. <laughs> um, and thank you again for your time, everyone, and we will catch you next month. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>